Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, we're gonna be covering gastrointestinal disorders, but to be more specific, we're gonna be going over inflammatory disorders of the GI system. Now, before we get started, as always, I'm gonna ask you to please support me and support this channel by liking this video. You're gonna love it. So go ahead and give it a thumbs up now so you don't forget. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already, and be sure to check out my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. There you can sign up for a Next Generation NCLEX review session. You can sign up for a one-on-one -on -one tutoring session. Maybe you wanna pick my brain about something sign up for a consultation session if you're a current nursing student i have something in store for you too if you go to my website again nexusnursinginstitute.com i have audio lessons that are available so be sure to check that out almost daily you can find me covering a variety of nursing topics across my social media platforms including of course right here youtube but instagram Facebook, and TikTok. My handle's the same everywhere, Nexus Nursing. Now, before we get started, I want to start off with a prayer. If you're not into that, that's fine. Just go ahead and fast forward. And if you are and not operating heavy machinery, go ahead, close your eyes, bow your head. Father God, thank you, Lord. Thank you for another day on this earth. Thank you for the breath of life in our bodies. Thank you for the health that you've given us, Father God. Lord, we ask for forgiveness for our sins. We know we come short of your glory every second, every single second. But Father God, thank you, Lord, that you sent your son to die on the cross. That all we have to do is ask for forgiveness and it's free you've been given. Thank you for that, Father God. Lord, I pray for every single viewer, every single listener right now, Lord, for whatever reason they've come to this channel. Father God, I ask that you please help them to understand this information. Help them to be able to process it, Father God. Help them to be able to think critically and when they see these same types of questions or these same types of concepts father god they can understand and answer the question appropriately lord please help me deliver this information in a way that is palatable to the students and they can understand it thank you for all you've done and all you continue doing jesus christ we pray amen all right guys let's get started so first question says you're performing the initial assessment of a client who reports the presence of lower right abdominal pain for the last two days upon examination you note the client's abdomen is rigid with tense positioning what conclusion can you draw, draw from this information a the client is experiencing an adverse reaction to opioids b the client is experiencing an exacerbation of crohn's disease C, the client is experiencing a remission of appendicitis symptoms, or D, the client is, is experiencing perforation of the appendix and peritonitis. And guys, the correct answer is D. We got lots of clues that would lead us to the D. Let's take a look. So the first one, right lower abdominal pain. When you hear right lower abdominal pain, what should you automatically be thinking of? Appendicitis. Now let's keep going. Abdomen rigid with tense positioning. Why do you think that abdomen's rigid? The reason that abdomen's rigid, most likely that appendix, which was inflamed, has now what? Ruptured. Now we're most likely dealing with appendicitis. And by the way, this is a potentially lethal diagnosis, okay? So that's what you're going to suspect. That's what you're going to be worried about. Perforation, just imagine um, fecal matter in what's supposed to be a sterile environment. Now, choice A, the client is experiencing adverse reaction to opioids. What are you talking about? There, there's not even any mention of opioids in this question. That makes absolutely no sense to choose that as your answer. Choice B, the client is experiencing an exacerbation of Crohn's disease. Uh, no. Patients who have Crohn's disease will see signs and symptoms such as nausea, vomiting, you know, diarrhea, abdominal cramp, not specifically right lower quadrant pain, right, for two days and then seeing rigid abdomen. Choice C, the client's experiencing a remission of appendicitis symptoms. Um, how are they experiencing a remission of the symptoms when it tells us the patient's not only having the pain for the past two days, now they have a rigid, intense positioning. That does not spell out remission, absolutely not. The only correct answer choice here is D. You're preparing to, excuse me, you're preparing a client diagnosed with acute appendicitis for surgery. Which of the following interventions would be contraindicated in this client? A, keeping the client NPO, B, administering IV fluids, C, placing a he heating pad on the abdomen, or D, placing the client in semi fowler's position. So what's contraindicated is what we would not want to do under any circumstances, and that's C, placing a heating pad on the abdomen. So let me get this right. The appendix is inflamed, this patient's in pain, and your bright idea is to apply heat to the area. What does heat do causes vasodilation? So now we have more circulation coming to that area, which will do what? Increase that swelling, increase that inflammation, which will do what? Increase the risk of perforation. And I just told you, perforation, that is deadly. 
that can cause peritonitis, which is deadly, right? So we don't want to do that. But everything else, absolutely, any patient that's going into surgery, we want them to be in PO. That patient that's going into surgery that has appendicitis, we are concerned of possible perforation. We're concerned about possible um, peritonitis. We're concerned about that po patient possibly going into shock. Remember, this patient's gonna be NPO. They still need fluid and electrolytes, right? So they're gonna get IV fluids. That's a good idea. And then choice D, placing them in semi fowler's position. Perfect. The only thing we would not do is apply heat to the area. You note that a client with extensive peritonitis has developed evidence of decreased circulatory volume. What physiological, what physiologic parameter should you monitor as a result of this altercation? A, heart rate, B, urine output, C, pedal pulses, or D, temperature? And guys, the correct answer is B, urine output. What in this question led us to urine output? I'll tell you what phrase, decreased circulatory volume. Whenever the volume of fluid within the vascular space goes down, right, your circulatory system is going to be impaired. What is the first organ that's going to shut down the kidneys? Yep, that urine output that's supposed to be at least 30 mLs per hour, you're going to see it start to drop. And so what you do is, as the nurse, if you start to see a trend, let's say the patient's urine output was 100, then it goes down to 90, then it goes down to 80. You see that trend, you're going to notify the healthcare provider. You're not going to wait until the urine output is less than 30 to let the healthcare provider know that something's wrong when you, you've been seeing that downward trend, right? You see that downward trend, you're going to notify the healthcare provider. Urine output, again, remember, urine output is supposed to be at least 30 mLs per hour. Uh, by the way, uh, peritonitis, I don't remember if I told you what that is or not, but that's uh, inflammation of the peritoneum. And usually that happens from perforation. So you have bacteria, you have pathogens in what is supposed to be a sterile environment. What laboratory data would serve to alert you to a serious complication of peritonitis? A, a positive blood culture. B, WBC of 20,000. C, elevated serum amylase level. D, presence of WBCs in the urine. And guys, the correct answer is A, positive blood culture. So the question is asking us what would um, be a signal to us of a serious complication of peritonitis. Well, I just told you, peritonitis is having... Uh, um, it's inflammation of the peritoneum and having basically bacteria, pathogens in what is supposed to be a sterile environment. Why is this so deadly? Because the patient can become septic. Duh, A, positive blood culture, right? Choices B, C, and D. All of these are bad, but they're not as bad as A, number one, right? It's not as serious as A, and A is uh, leads more to uh, that diagnosis of peritonitis than anything else because of the sepsis. You're performing wound care with peritoneal irrigation through a drain for a client who is post-op from an exploratory laparotomy to correct peritonitis. Which finding would alert you that the client is retaining the arrogant? Is it A, hyperactive bowel sounds in all quadrants, B, tympani to percussion of the abdomen, C, abdominal distension and pain, or D, tenting of the abdominal skin? And the correct answer is C, abdominal distension and pain. So if the patient is holding on to all this fluid, what you're going to see is abdominal distension. The reason that abdomen is getting distended is because the fluid is not going anywhere. It's staying within that abdominal area and the skin's going to get tight. It's being stretched, right? That makes sense. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. A, hyperactive bowel sounds in all quadrants. Actually, those bowel sounds would be hypoactive. B, tympani to percussion in the abdomen, um, we hear dull sounds. And D, tenting of the abdominal skin. Nope, that skin would actually be taut. So the correct answer is C, abdominal distension and pain. A 76-year-old client who's been ill with fever and diarrhea for several days is diagnosed with gastroenteritis. For what possible complication of this illness should you monitor the client? A, dehydration, B, hypertension, C, rectal access, rectal access, rectal abscess, or D, mucus in the stool. 
All right, guys, so the correct answer is a dehydration. How do we know the answer is a dehydration? Okay, we're dealing with a 76 year old patient. So this is an elderly patient, a geriatric patient, and they've got gastroenteritis. Basically, they've got the stomach bug. They're gonna have diarrhea. They're gonna have cramps. They're gonna have nausea. They're gonna have vomiting. They're going to be losing fluid and electrolytes through the vomiting and through the diarrhea. And they're elderly. Elderly patients are at risk for what? Dehydration. Remember, when it comes to geriatric population, they lose their sense of thirst. That's why you always have to remind them to drink fluids. They are already at risk for dehydration. They are already at risk for being dehydrated just because they're elderly. On top of that, they've got um, gastroenteritis where they're vomiting and they have diarrhea. Dehydration. Um, that's, that's going to be our number one uh, concern. An 82-year-old woman admitted with severe gastroenteritis is having up to 15 watery stools per day. What nursing intervention would be a priority for this client? A, replacing fluids. B, ensuring skin care. C, changing positions frequently. D, providing a bedside commode. And I know you guys all got this cor answer correct. It's A, replacing fluids. Again, this is an elderly patient and they're telling us that they have gastroenteritis. So we know they've got vomiting. We know they got diarrhea. We know they're losing fluid and electrolytes. It needs to be replaced. Guys, whenever you're getting a question about um, what's going to be a priority, I need you to think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Maslow's hierarchy of needs, physiological integrity is always going to be a priority. What is physically keeping your patient alive? Vital signs blood pressure, uh, respirations, pulse, glucose, fluid and electrolytes, airway, breathing, circulation, anything that's physically keeping your patient alive is always going to be the priority. And that's why replacing fluids is the answer. Why? We want to prevent that patient from going into shock. We're trying to prevent circulatory collapse. Now, B, C, and D, all of these are good things to address, but it's not going to take priority over physiological integrity, such as fluid and electrolytes, preventing circulatory collapse, A, replacing fluids. Next question. The nurse is assessing the abdomen of a client with abdominal pain and diarrhea. What clinical manifestation would the nurse consider abnormal for a client with gastroenteritis? A, diffuse abdominal pain. B, rebound tenderness. C, I, C hyperactive bowel sounds. Or D, elevated temperature. And guys, the correct answer is B, rebound tenderness. So go back to the question. It says you're assessing the abdomen of a patient that's having ab abdominal pain and they have diarrhea. What signs and symptoms are you going to consider to be abnormal for the patient that has a stomach bug, gastroenteritis? Rebound tenderness. When you see or hear rebound tenderness, what should you be thinking of? Peritonitis. Peritonitis, not gastroenteritis. You see choices A, C, and D, diffuse abdominal pain, hyperactive bowel sounds, elevated temperature. Those are expected findings of gastroenteritis, but not rebound tenderness. We see rebound tenderness again in peritonitis, not gastroenteritis. You're reviewing the laboratory data of a client with gastroenteritis who's having approximately 20 foul smelling stools per day. Analysis of the stool reveals the presence of WBCs and RBCs. What organism should you suspect the cause of the client's gastroenteritis? E. coli, S. aurea, Shigella, or Campylobacter? And the correct answer is D, Campylobacter. How do we know it's Campylobacter? Number one, the foul smelling stools. That's your first hint. Number two, when they say 20, uh, 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 20 foul smelling stools per day with Campylobacter, the patient will have anywhere between 20 to 30 of those foul smelling uh, stools, stools per day. And your third hint was the WBC and RBCs in the stool. We see that in Campylobacter. So those were the three clues to let us know we were dealing with choice D. A client admitted with gastroenteritis is preparing for discharge. Which statement made by the client indicates a need for further skin care teaching? A, I will take a sits bath three times per day. B, I'll clean the rectal area with warm water. C, I'll clean the rectal area liberally with tissue. D, I'll, I will dry the skin around the buttocks following cleansing. And the correct answer is C. 
I'll clean the rectal area liberally with toilet tissue. So whenever a question asks you which one needs uh, further teaching, they're asking you for the wrong answer choice. And if you look at the question, this patient has gastroenteritis, which means they're vomiting a lot and they have a lot of diarrhea. You want to know what diarrhea in urine does on the skin. It causes maceration, it causes excoriation. So that, that area is going to be very tender, right? So we're not going to want to use toilet tissue. Absolutely not excuse me, you're going to want to use a super absorbent cotton, right? But you're not going to want to use toilet tissue. It's going to be too irritating on the skin. All of the other choices are good. Sits bath, wonderful. Um, warm water, wonderful. Uh, drying the skin around the buttocks fine, um, following cleansing, wonderful. But no toilet tissue. Again, no toilet tissue, no harsh soaps. We don't want anything that's going to be irritating to the area. What statement regarding the symptoms of ulcerative colitis is true? A, the client may have five to six soft stools per day. B, the client may have 10 to 20 stadereal stools per day. C, the client may have 10 to 20 liquid bloody stools per day. Or D, the client may have abdominal pain, but the stool appearance is normal. Which one is true? And the correct answer is C, the client may have 10 to 20 liquid bloody stools per day. So what do we talk about? Ulcerative colitis. Ulcerative colitis, the patient's going to have abdominal cramps. They're going to have pain. They're going to have rectal um, bleeding and the diarrhea. They're going to have diarrhea. The diarrhea is going to look bloody, okay? Ulcerative colitis is not fun. Yeah, 10 to 20 liquid bloody stools per day. The colon is going to look hemorrhagic. It's going to look red when it comes to ulcerative colitis. The other choice is wrong. A, the client may have five to six soft stools per day. First of all, they're going to have 10 to 20 stools, and the stools are not going to be soft. They're going to be liquid, diarrhea, okay? Choice B, the client may have 10 to 20. You see that 10 to 20 part? That part's correct. So if you stop there, you would have chose that as the answer. But what do I tell you? Always read the whole thing because if the whole answer isn't right, the whole answer is wrong. So yes, they may have 10 to 20 liquid. Oh, no, no, B. They may have 10 to 20, but look at statereal. You know what that word statereal? Like fatty stools. No, the stools, not they're going to have 10 to 20 liquid bloody stools, not fatty stools. We're not talking about like, you know, malabsorption, right? We're talking about ulcerative colitis. Choice D, client may have abdominal pain. That part is true. They may have abdominal pain. They may have cramping, but let's keep going. But stool appearance appears normal. No, it won't. It will appear liquid and bloody. So the correct answer is choice C. What alteration in lab findings would you expect to find manifested by a client with ulcerative colitis? A, decreased WBC secondary to arthritis induced by the disease. B, increased total protein secondary to malabsorption syndrome. C, elevated erythrocyte sedimentation rate secondary to inflammation. D, increased serum potassium level secondary sodium losses in the stools. There's only one correct answer here, guys, and it's C. We're going to see elevated uh, ESR, erythrocyte sedimentation rate. Whenever you see ESR is elevated, you know there's inflammation that's happening. And this is what we're doing, dealing with, ulcerative colitis. Okay, itis. What is, words that end in itis, what does that mean? Inflammation of. Colitis. Inflammation of what? Colon. And ulcerative colitis. By the way, in ulcerative colitis, it's not only the colon that um, is involved, but um, I was just saying that to make a point for you to remember when it ends in itis, you're going to see, inf you're going to think of inflammation. So back to this, this is what's happening. You see elevated ESR because this is an inflammatory disorder. Look at A, decreased WBC, ab absolutely. I'm sorry, guys. I get excited and then I get tongue tied. I have to slow down. So decreased WBC, that is uh, false. If anything, you may see increased WBC. B, increased total um, protein. Nope. If anything, you'll see decreased total protein. And then D, increased serum potassium. Remember, this patient's got lots of stools. They're losing potassium through the stool. So we'll see decreased potassium, not increased potassium. So the only correct choice here, guys, is C. A client with ulcerative colitis has been prescribed sulfasalazine. What instructions should be given to the client regarding the medication regimen? A, take this medication after meals. B, these tablets should be crushed for easier swallowing. C, decrease your fluid intake 
while taking this medication, or D, you may discontinue the medication when your symptoms subside. And the correct answer is A, take this medication after meal. So first of all, let's talk about this medication. What drug class does it fall into? Well, it really falls under two because it's an anti, um, uh, neoplastic. It's an anti-neoplastic drug. So we can, it's given to treat some cancers, but it's also an anti-inflammatory drug. So in this case, we'd give it for anti-inflammatory uh, measures. A, take this medication after meals. You can either take it after meals or with food, but it causes GI irritation. So in order to decrease the GI irritation, you're not gonna take it on an empty stomach, either after meals or with food. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. B, these tablets may be crushed for easier swallowing. N swallowing, no, that's false. They're enteric coated. You're not gonna crush them. Uh, C, decrease your fluid intake while taking this medication. Absolutely not, because what we don't want is crystallization in the urine. So you're going to teach the patient the opposite. You're going to tell them to increase their fluid intake with this medication. And then choice D, you may discontinue this medication when your symptoms subside. When in the history of nursing have we ever told a patient, oh, you can stop taking the medication once you feel better? Right? You're going to tell the patient to take this medication as ordered, even if they're feeling better. So the correct answer here, guys, again, is choice A. And we are down to our last question. You're caring for a client with ulcerative colitis who's been prescribed oral, let me see if I can pronounce this drug. Merc, I can't pronounce it. You guys see that drug on the screen? Purinethyl, I'm gonna call it by its trade name, Purinethyl. Which clinical manifestation would alert you to a possible effect of this medication? A, lower extremity edema, B, tachycardia, C, sore throat, or D, agitation? And guys, the correct answer is C, sore throat. So let me explain. This medication is an immunosuppressive agent. Any drug that is an immunosuppressive agent one of your main nursing interventions is going to be to watch out for signs and symptoms of infection, right? Because a slight increase in temperature, a slight, you know, slight redness if there's a wound or mucopurulent drainage or any of those signs and symptoms of infection, even if it's a little bit, it may be a large infection in the patient. Why? Because they're taking an immunosuppressant agent. So any sign and symptom of infection, sore throat, fever, cough, anything that would cause you to suspect sign symptom of infection, you are going to notify the healthcare uh, provider immediately. This medication suppresses the bone marrow, okay? You're going to report any sign and symptom of infection. And that is it for this video. If you guys would like to see more um, uh, videos on this subject, inflammatory disorders of the intestinal system, please let me know in the comment section and I'll definitely make a part two if you're interested. Guys, don't forget to check out my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. I've been seeing your comments. And for those who are new to my channel and don't know, the reason you're not seeing my videos as often as you do before is because I take the summers off. June, July, August, I'm trying to be outside. I'm trying to be outside and live my best life, right? So any videos you see um, produced during those months, be grateful because I really try um, not to do much for three months. I really just want to travel and spend time with my family, okay? So I apologize. You're not seeing my videos as often. I'm just not making them as often. But as soon as September comes, I'll be right back on the regular schedule. But in the meantime, you can watch all my other videos. I have over a thousand videos up on my YouTube channel. So just be sure to check them out. Don't forget to check out my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Thank you so, so much for watching guys. And you guys will catch me on the next video.